So welcome to welcome to uh, Johns Hopkins APL and to a global Google Hangout, which is going to be uh, live from several sites around the world, which you'll be meeting very soon. I'm Jeff Haynstiles. I'm the on-camera moderator from Johns Hopkins APL, which is mission control for the New Horizons mission. Uh, we have about uh, five minutes before all the sites start working. This is an informal uh, orientation for those of you who may be listening on air. You'll be seeing visualizations of exactly what the New Horizons spacecraft is doing at this very moment at Pluto. We're traveling faster than the speed of light. Um, because this is not four and a half hours, light hours away from Earth. This is exactly what the spacecraft is doing, thanks to a collaboration between AMNH and Linköping University in Sweden. And you'll be seeing and hearing information from both AMNH and Sweden during the course of this uh, two-hour live event. So thanks very much for joining us. We still have some housekeeping details to do and you'll hear us talking about audio and video as we go. Hope you enjoy it. You can send in questions via uh, the chat, uh, via the Q&A function uh, in the Google Hangout, and you can also use Twitter, the Twitter hashtag is It's, uh, I'm just trying to pull that up. It's uh, hashtag capital P L U T O Q, capital Q, lowercase. So AMNH is host site in New York City. Carter Emmett is the uh, one of the developers and project directors for the Open Space Software, and one of the curators, Denton Ebel, is uh, greeting folks there. That is the hashtag for Twitter questions, hashtag Pluto Qs, and AMNH has somebody standing by to take questions coming in via Twitter and to route them to us here in APL. So about uh, a minute before we're going to go live, we have a range of different scientists who are going to be with us uh, throughout the broadcast. They are running around uh, in a rather crazy way at the moment because so much is happening here at APL, but they will be with us soon. Good morning. Uh, welcome to Breakfast at Pluto. And for a few introductory remarks, over to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, where it's just after 7 a.m. in the morning of Pluto Day, July the 14th, 2015. 
over to AM and H. Hello. Welcome. People still coming in? Welcome to the Museum of Natural History. Welcome to our Pluto event. Good to see you all here. I'm joined by Carter Amart, our Director of Visualization, Astro Visualization at the Museum. I'm Denton Abel, I'm Curator in Physical Sciences here, and I'm really excited about today's event. You guys are part of, you and everyone a part of this Google Hangout, are part of an unprecedented, unique experience that uh, we hope will recreate and set a tone for the future for space exploration. Because this is also about a unique and amazing adventure uh, exploration, the New Horizons mission to Pluto. So I'm going to turn this uh, over. We're, we're being joined by planetariums uh, around the world. And I'm going to turn this over to our mission control producer, Jeffrey Haynes Stiles, and uh, his colleague, Michael Marcinkowski, who is uh, our prime developer for our open space software, which you'll learn about today uh, at, at the Applied Physics Lab in Maryland. Take it away, Jeff. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the breakfast at Pluto, even if some of you are having lunch and some of you are thinking about an evening meal, because we've got a global set of connections ar around the planet. We're going to introduce you to those in a few moments. We have a range of different mission scientists who work with the different instruments on board New Horizons who are going to be joining us. Uh, they are obviously having a field day with all the new images, and some new images will actually be released by about 8 o'clock uh, this morning our time, so about one hour ahead of us uh, now. So we'll try and bring you those images just as soon as NASA puts them on the web. We're going to go down and just introduce you to the various sites that are participating. Uh, this is not necessarily in any particular geographical order, but they're just the way they appear on this Google Hamout film strip. I'm going to go first of all to Brisbane, Australia, to introduce yourself and say who's with us in Brisbane, Australia. Thank you, Jeff. Mark Rigby, curator of the Sir Thomas Brisbane Planetarium in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, it is uh, just after 9 p.m. here on Tuesday. And uh, from the only city on planet Earth named for an astronomer, by the way, Sir Thomas Brisbane. And uh, we're gathered here tonight. Uh, we have a dome. We're in the dome, actually, at the planetarium. And uh, we have an audience here, generally people from uh, all walks of life in Brisbane, and uh, keen to uh, watch this last few moments And uh, as we head into Pluto. Thank you, Brisbane. Uh, I don't see uh, Thomas Kropi or Sasha in uh, Hamburg, so we'll come back to you in a moment. Let us uh, go to the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, uh, Illinois, USA. Good morning, Jeff. My name is Mike Smale. I'm the theater manager here at the Adler Planetarium. We're actually going to have two full houses today, both in our sky feed, in the dome simulation, and then downstairs we're going to have an overflow crowd. Uh, they're filling into the building right now. They've actually been waiting outside for the last 45 minutes, so we're all pretty excited and ready to go. I think what we found since we did live from the Hubble Space Telescope back in uh, 1995, Pluto is everybody's favorite planet, and we can talk about planets and not planets later, but I think that, as Alan Stern says, after you fly by this body, you're not going to have much doubt about what you want to call it. So, uh, Italy, we also have Italy with us. Uh, buongiorno and guten tag, Italy. Come in, buongiorno. David. Buongiorno, guten tag. Uh, we like uh, to say hello from Bolza from Guma, actually in Italy. There's a nice audience here of around 53, even more people, uh, Italians, Germans, tourists, uh, students, children, everybody here, and very anxious to see the visualization, the comments of the scientists, and maybe asking also a couple of questions. So we're glad to join this, uh, this historic event. Thank you, Italy. I'm going to jump back to Hamburg, where I think I see Thomas Krauper uh, on camera. And guten tag, Thomas. Nice to see you again. However, your, cam your audio seems to be muted. But we'll give you a few seconds while I make idle chit-chat, and then we'll say hello to uh, Hamburg, Germany. Actually, we'll jump over to uh, Ling Choping, uh, which is the source of the visualization. And Professor Anders uh, will say hello to us, and uh, we'll, I'll show you some of the visualization, which is going on in real time. Great. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, we're, uh, 
I have a wonderful audience here today in, in Norrköping at the Visland Station Center. We have about 100 people here uh, expecting to see some wonderful stuff happening on the screen. Uh, I'd like to give credit to the, the people that did the development, uh, the students of Norrköping. Uh, over here we have Alexander and Joachim and Michael over with you. Uh, they have really been the ones that have been driving the effort to develop open space to, to make this kind of event, uh, event possible. So it's, it's great uh, to join in with all of you and, and this unique event and uh, we look forward to hearing all your commentary. Thank you. And we will try one more time to see if uh, Hamburg can speak to us now. Thomas, yeah. come in. Hello. Hello, Jeff. I hope you can hear me now. We can hear you now, Thomas. Well, it's really great to be back after our live from Pluto, live from Hubble, 20 years ago. And you know this planetarium, Hamburg Planetarium, was opened when Pluto was just discovered. So now we're here back again uh, and uh, joining with the world to meet Pluto. And we have a small crowd here, uh, a dedicated crowd here, and we're looking forward to the encounter. Very good. So those are all of our sites, uh, and back to AMNH in New York City, where uh, Carter and Denton have been joined by a rather familiar figure to some of you. Over to New York City. I'll, I'll welcome Neil deGrasse Tyson, the, 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 the Frederick Rose Director of the Hayden Planetarium here in New York. Welcome, Neil. I should say hi to all of my colleagues out there in the planetariums of the world. I haven't seen many of you in, in quite a few years, but uh, it's great to be part of the same event with all of you, and how beautiful it is that it is Pluto that brings us all together in this way. Well said, well said. So we, we are going to go to our simulation and, and our real time, what's going on right now, or soon, in Pluto. But first, we wanted to give you a little bit of introduction. Um, we have a queue of... Um, I don't know if this is this well, long. Oh, yeah. Did I do that? You did that. Uh, now okay. Oh, what this, this is. Uh, I just switched to the visualization because it looked as if you were trying to find the visualization, right. Denton. Uh, yeah, but we actually wanted to go through the intro first, um, and given that the time, I think we should stick to that. So, can we go back to the uh, um, introductory material? Switch projectors, please. Thank you. These are sites. So here's this is a visualization of the sites that are involved in this in this in this hangout um, all over the world. Um, this is of course the New Horizons spacecraft while it was uh, being assembled. Um, it's covered with gold foil and it is quite large actually. Over here you see the radio thermal generator that is um, right here and various instruments, which we'll talk about in, in a bit. Next. Yep. Okay, here's the launch. This is 2006. January 19th, it was glorious. It's the fastest rocket ever launched from Cape Canaveral. Largest booster with the smallest payload. Passed the moon in nine hours, which took the uh, Apollo astronauts three days to cross. Sounded like a Harley Davidson going straight up into the sky. So here we are seeing a simulation, of course, in our digital universe. Um, of how, where the spacecraft went very fast, flying by Jupiter, uh, which we'll see a little of later on. 2007. And continuing out a long way, and actually entering hibernation, and then coming back out of hibernation uh, last, last December. Looks like it got a gravity assist from Jupiter. Oh, yeah, yeah. big time. It is now yeah. going about eight miles per second. Uh, yeah. Um, Nine and a half years from launch to Pluto encounter today. Satisfying the number one rule of science that you want to complete your experiment before you die, right? <laughs> so 
<laughs> I, uh, Alan Stern, you know, he's not old, but he wants to make sure he's the PI of the mission. He wants to make sure it gets to Pluto while he can still analyze the data. And he also likes to go really fast. Yeah, he yes, he's, he a, he's, a, he's a fighter pilot. I, uh, for, for myself, driving across uh, from New Jersey to attend planetarium school here at age 10, the, I noticed that the George Washington Bridge is almost exactly one mile, and New Horizons will be passing Pluto at eight miles per second, which is pretty fast. Just remember that you all in this room, we're all going about twice that speed around the sun right now. Can you feel it? Yeah, no, you can't. Yeah, that's so um, these are some of the instruments we'll be talking about, and I, I won't go through all the acronyms. Um, Ralph is a uh, is an imaging camera. Lori is a, a, a far a, a, a long distance imager, and we've had some great long distance shots of Pluto already. Um, we have Alice, which is the ultraviolet spectrometer that will tell us a lot about the chemistry of the atmospheres of, of, of not just Pluto, but also perhaps of Charon, whether there is one actually atmosphere there. The radiothermal generator, which is a uh, nuclear of plutonium core, plutonium-238, uh, which powers the spacecraft. There ain't much sunlight out there. And uh, of course, the antenna that returns data to Earth. This is not a high gain antenna. That's why it's going to take almost uh, 16 months for all of the data collected today to return to the Earth uh, over a very well, low bandwidth. It's high gain, but it's, it's small. Very small. And uh, the Pepsi is a, is a, is a neutral particles and, and ion, ion uh, sensor for seeing how the solar wind strips material from Pluto. And that will be active uh, f going forward to see, as we go downstream solar wind-wise, what's going on with that and what is the rate at which Pluto loses things to the solar system. And the student dust counter, which was built by students at the University of Colorado, my alma mater, SDC right here. That has actually been on for the entire mission and has been monitoring the, uh, the interplanetary dust flux in the, in the solar system as it has gone out to, to Pluto. And again, something that has never been done before. If you're wondering the, the acronyms for Ralph and Alice, there are none. It stands for Ralph and Alice of the Honeymooners. You have to know Alan Stern. So here we are. This is just to show it by comparison. We have Earth, of course, uh, Moon, and this is an image of Pluto that is from the Hubble Space Telescope, and you can see that it's not that great. But the next image, uh, oh, this is just a comparison with Earth again, a different kind of comparison, looking at the uh, Pluto's exosphere atmosphere compared to that of the Earth. Pluto actually has a large uh, um, atmosphere as formally defined. But keep in mind that Pluto takes 248 years to orbit the sun. And so it is coming, it's 26 years now from its closest approach to the sun. And so this atmosphere will shrink uh, over the next 100 years and then expand again. But one of the reasons why this mission is important now is because this planet or body doesn't... <laughs> Uh, see, object. This object does not uh, doesn't go near near the sun very often, and so we don't want to wait another 200 years to do this. And this is a great time in Pluto's orbit to observe its 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 atmosphere. So this is a comparison. Uh, just to be clear, when on Earth we speak of atmosphere, we speak of uh, breathable molecules of air that at a density that we're familiar with. We are now talking of what kind of density of pressure relative to atmosphere? Uh, 10 to the minus 6 bar. <laughs> 10 to the minus 6, 4 times 10 to the minus 6 bars. That's 10 to the minus, that's 1 millionth of an Earth uh, pressure. Right. At the surface it's, okay, so I think atmosphere is being used very liberally here. There's a way to formally define atmosphere, that's which right. I agree with, and it's our, our particles sort of sustained in their own thermal motion. And, and so, I, so I don't have a problem with that definition. It's just when we say it has an atmosphere, I think we need to be forthcoming about how much atmosphere it isn't in this discussion. Google exobase. Exobase. That's the nitrogen, methane. Is name correctly spelled? So this is what Pluto looked like last Wednesday. Uh, 
we're coming in. This is the this is Lori, the long distance imager, uh, primarily, and some information on color from Ralph. Uh, this is actually a lot like the this is the okay. centered on about the same center that we will see in the data that comes down in the next day. You can move a little bit uh, closer to the screen. What the, the view of, of Pluto uh, that we get from the mission. Right okay. So advanced. Mm -hmm. And here's Saturday, and we're starting to see a lot of structure. We see that bullseye structure, which unfortunately will be in, in, in uh, on the other side of the planet uh, today. And we start to see this big white patch come around. And the next slide. That's, that's the heart shape I was tracing out. So the rotation rate. Uh, it co-rotates, actually, with um, Charon. Charon. So that's Sunday. Charon. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, and so here we can see the the uh, heart coming around. Again. We see the heart, the big white part, but also this black part down here. It's been nicknamed the whale. And the reason for these colors is not clear yet. No, no. Yeah. Well. Well. Colors in the a little introduction. Black and white parts, but there are shades of asking to change the visual illusion. Okay. So here we have uh, Pluto and Charon on Saturday, and yeah. Wait, wait, just we, we could back up one if you can, uh, just to follow up on what Carter was saying. Uh, both Pluto and and Charon are tidally locked to one another. So just as on Earth we have successfully tidally locked the Moon, so the Moon only shows one face to us. The moon is actually desperately trying to tidally lock us, and it's mildly succeeding. Every now and then we have to add a leap second to compensate for the slowing down of Earth's rotation. And so it will not succeed in the lifetime of the sun, so we don't have to worry about this fact. But uh, with Pluto and Charon, Charon is so massive relative to Pluto that Charon's effect on Pluto is actually quite strong, and they both tidally, it's a double tidal lock. They only ever show the same case to one another. And their center of mass is outside of the Pluto physical body. The Barry Center, which we'll illustrate in a second. Sure. So here, this is a, a tantalizing hint of some of the interesting geology shown in, in, these, in these images. We have, we have uh, on Karen, we have a dark polar region. Uh, we know that uh, polar regions have, are really cool. I mean, Mer Messenger found ice in the polar regions of Mercury. And... We we could see from uh, from spectra from from the Hubble or from Earth base that um, that we see methane on on uh, reflectance on on the surface of Pluto, but the reflectance spectra mainly from Charon Charon is um, <laughs> is water ice, um, possibly with ammonium mixed in things like that. But anyway, it's, yeah. and Pluto of course has other other cool things potentially these these. Scarps, which we will see. It just in mixed the two uses of cool. One was literally cold, and the other one was just, just socially like cool. Like yeah, yeah, okay. Just want to distinguish. We have, we have a couple minutes. It's okay, I just okay. Need to make sure. Okay. Make these distinctions clear. Kuiper belt. So this is this this slide to me is really tells us what the science is all about because. This is a artist's rendering of the Kuiper Belt. This is not actually where all the bodies are, and they're certainly not that densely packed. But we see Neptune, and we think dynamically that Neptune is responsible for spreading out these bodies that are now the Kuiper Belt. And the history of this dynamics is, is something that we'll get at with this mission. And the understanding of what these bodies are made out of, how they interact, and that, that's all part of this. And as we explore other solar systems, exoplanets, and those disks around other stars in detail, understanding these outer parts becomes more, more and more a part of the story because we see what are the similarities between our solar system and those systems, and what are the differences. And the outer parts are actually in some cases, easier to see than than the parts that are that are close in, like Earth and Venus and Mars. And those, those I'm going to move us just along because uh, we want to get to a certain observations coming up. Just uh, yep, got it. Um, and um, so, uh, really, this this mission sort of started off um, with this uh, stamp set, um, and uh, back um, 
Oh boy, I'm not exactly sure. This is 91. 91, thank you. And uh, so uh, Ron Miller's uh, painting of uh, Pluto not yet explored, uh, and that has some history in that, and uh, so that we've moved, moved along. I just want to uh, really show you here what you're about to see, and uh, because we're going to be watching this simulation, and so up here, I'm just very quickly going through. Um, this is our visualization. We're going to be jumping to this full screen, but this is just going back in time to show you how the software coordinates the navigational information from NASA together with the imagery, the images. So these images of this mosaic of the red spot in Terminator is actually this combination of the aiming from NASA's navigation files and then the precise timing of the images that come together. So in the case of after uh, we fly past Pluto, we'll be able to put the pictures together. So if I just go here, the next, next, okay, and run, good. So what we see here, and we're going to see this in detail but running in real time, here is a time lapse where we see the New Horizons spacecraft and we're seeing basically the eyes, what its different eyes. So this is this spatula looking thing up here. We'll talk more about that, but that's the ultraviolet instrument. But right here in close up, we're actually seeing the LORI camera, the telescopic camera. It's almost like a sort of 8 inch or 10 inch Celestron, you know, it's sort of telescope that uh, is actually uh, its, its highest res instrument uh, making this mosaic. And then very close this approach, uh, passing, and uh, we'll be seeing this. This is actually the time we'll be monitoring here. But then I also want to point out these are the shadows. This is the shadow. We show it light here, but this is the shadow of Pluto and the Pluto and Charon behind it, actually. And uh, this is the trajectory line that we see. And then we see uh, the orbits of the various satellites uh, in the Plutonian system. And so here we're just adopting this, uh, these placeholder images. And um, so then also later, uh, the plasma roll by the uh, spacecraft. This is something after our program today. But basically, um, the uh, instrument Pepsi, which has a um, sort of a view that's a, a swath across the sky. Imagine taking a ruler out in the rain and using that to you know, sort of cover you in the rain. You don't want that. You want to spin it and turn it into a parasol, into a an umbrella, and that's essentially what they're doing with that field of view, so they're getting sort of a hemispheric view when they do that plasma roll. And this is just systematically what it looks like, Oops. and uh, I'm just jumping. This is the software if you want to download it. Uh, it's free and uh, open source, and thanks to our collaboration with uh, Linshipping University in Sweden. So I think we're ready to go live. We can switch over. Thanks. Yes, thanks very much. We're back here at APL, and of course the stars of the show, apart from Pluto and its satellites, are the scientists that are making sense of all the visualizations. And so the first of our science guests is uh, Orkan Umuhan, who works with Laurie and the Geology Group. He's going to correct my pronunciation of his name, and going to tell you about all of the incredible stuff that has got these guys so excited. Uh, so over to you, Olka. Let's, uh, let's zoom in on the pylori frame. Uh, can we get the, uh, uh, the the coverage patterns removed there? I don't want to sh tell people. We just saw the high resolution images about an hour ago of this view, and it's something astonishingly beautiful and amazing. And in about one hour's time, it's going to be uh, released to the public. So uh, once uh, once you get a chance, go check it out. So if we can kind of zoom in onto the surface pattern uh, of, the, uh, of the what we're calling the heart, or I like to call it the, the rising eagle, we can look to the, uh, to the uh, uh, left side of the wing. Yeah, right over there. Uh, All right. Oh, yes. That's, yes. Um, can you hear me? This is Carter in New York. Hey, Carter. Hey, um, I just wanted to say, yes, this, this view, if we actually pull back a little bit like you've just done, Michael, thank you. Um, and um, also, okay, so uh, let's, I just want to point out for our, our public here that if we look in the upper left, we can see the time and that we're one, running one second per second. And this is the current time. This is a you know, universal time up here, which is four hours ahead of Eastern Daylight Time, 
but since we have global partners on this, we all have different local time, but this is coordinated universal time. And so that we're seeing now these, these image campaigns that are taking place right now. As or, we, take it away, sorry. Yeah, as we speak. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the coverage here. Uh, we have a number of mosaics, the larger squares that you see, and many of them overlay on top of each other. Uh, so we will be using the high resolution data taken from all of these images and in the overlap zones we'll be constructing topographic maps from um, a stereo, basically we have a stereo uh, imaging analysis process where you take a particular landscape and you look at it from two different angles and based on the relative shading from the different angles of the photo you, one can reconstruct the, uh, the elevation for that local point. So there's a procedure that's done to uh, uh, construct a map, or at least especially in the areas where you have um, overlapping coverage. So essentially we're going to get high resolution uh, uh, elevation information down to likely, I think as I recall, 50 meter scale in terms of relative elevation from the, the base uh, on all the way up to however high uh, these structures go. So uh, now the smaller, uh, the smaller frames, these are the MVIC scan frames, similar struct, similar principle as well. We take a series of photos and you see that in the cutting across the middle, so not the large squares but the smaller ones cutting across like a belt across the, uh, uh, the planet, you see that uh, we have similar kind of coverage and in those zones we're going to also have very nice high resolution information and we're going to be able to construct our topographic maps. It's going to be one of those things that if ever we end up going there, <laughs> you could go hiking on uh, with your topographic map in hand. Of course it might be a little cold, but that's another story. I wouldn't uh, be concerned about that at that stage. But um, yeah, so we saw some of the uh, high resolution uh, global view and so the strips that we see covered here are actually very interesting. It might not seem that they are at this stage but they are actually the high, the high resolution imaging that we have and the coverage that we see here right now um, is going to reveal, I mean we already see some beautiful structure, things that are unlike uh, what uh, we expect and some things that we do obviously expect. But we do see cratering, not as much as uh, one expected, but you should, some people on our team were quite relieved to hear and see that there were actually craters to count. So that was very nice. Um, but beyond that, we see all kinds of uh, patterns similar, like, akin to things like scarp retreat. Um, we see sublimation, what appear to be sublimation patterns uh, in, in the uh, uh, in the lower plains and in especially in the transition zones from the lower plains where nitrogen frost appears to be high, large, more largely concentrated in the upper elevations where they appear to be absent. And so we see clear geology. There is actually interesting geology uh, already evident from the, these early, um, the early images, uh, from the early this morning's image. Orkan, I, I'm just going to break in a little bit in, in case, so I just wanted to emphasize or re-emphasize that what we're, what we're seeing live here is exactly what's happening but in a simulation and these images uh, are being taken now but the spacecraft is under blackout. It's just observing right now. That's and right. So that these images are going to be trickling in later but this is, this is why uh, we've sort of doing this event and putting this together to sort of show you what's going on at the moment. So we don't have these images yet. Is that right, Orkan? That's correct. We don't have these images yet. And thank you for pointing that out, Carter, that as we speak, these images are being taken and will be taken. I mean, they're actually being taken as we speak. So that's why it's so very exciting. Having seen the global image just an hour ago, uh, there are there's a tremendous amount of treasure information it's going to come from this this zone, so it's very exciting, very very exciting. Work on you saw the image, but we the world has not yet because you're on the geology and geophysics uh, imaging team. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So, and I want to emphasize again: keep your eyes peeled after eight o'clock. That image is going to be released to the public. We'll show it to you. <laughs> yeah, I'd be good to see it. I again. promise. 
Uh, so, can I answer any questions? Anything that comes to mind? I mean, there's so much to talk about. I almost don't even know where to start. Um, I'll, I'll say we have uh, carts, uh, we have pencils and paper. If people would like to ask questions, you can write them on a piece of paper and hand them to someone to bring up to the front. So, this is. I got a question for you. Uh, yeah. Neil Tyson here from hey, New York City. Good to hear from uh, you. Yeah, hi. Good to hear from you. Yeah, at breakfast time here, everyone's had their coffee, so they're all ready and alert um, to think about <laughs> this flyby. Uh, you were office mates with, with him, right? With Orcon back in Columbia? For the first oh, one month when I arrived at Columbia, we shared a <laughs> brief okay. office together. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to uh, bring up the idea that you might one day want to go hiking there. Uh, hoping <laughs> to that it's cold. Um, uh, it has significantly less surface gravity than Earth, so hiking would be a pretty trivial matter on Pluto. I, I can't argue that. with that. Oh, right. Oh, we're seeing okay. the, <laughs> just being broadcast? Be clear. <laughs> just You'd be, be quite a frolic if you went hiking on Pluto. Excellent. So, so the image... We just got from Twitter and Instagram, thanks to David Grinspoon, who's right here we're with us. And Orkin's now going to be a comment about yesterday's image. Yeah, so this is yesterday. Uh, is my cursor showing? I believe the cursor can be seen. So this is yesterday's image. We saw it this morning. The image was taken yesterday, uh, and it got processed. Uh, basically, it came down got processed. And this is the wing of the eagle, or the left or the right ventricle of the heart. Uh, and the coverage that we're going to get, this high resolution coverage that we're going to get, essentially cuts across this zone. If you can follow my uh, my cursor, and can you guys full screen it? Is it full screened? Uh, uh, we don't. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is good. It seems to have gone away when you full screen it. So oh. it's all my fault. Sorry. Oh, Carter, it's okay. Look at that. <laughs> yes. So right now we can't really say one th one way or the other uh, what we're looking at, but there's been a lot of conjecture in the last hour. Uh, I just wanted to point out some of the obvious features. You can see the head of the whale to the left, a dark region, and then you can see. The, the wing, the left side of the wing of this eagle. And, the, uh, and what's important, we see the strong albedo contrast. And so this is also of interest to the scientists, of course, because we're going to have coverage of this zone. Uh, we can see uh, several types of lineation patterns here. If you look, follow my cursor up in this zone. Um, what these are, we, we are not ready to say, of course, but we are uh, uh, puzzling over it right now. Uh, what we see, what appears to be uh, the uh, uh, scarp retreat, if you look at the um, edges here of, of the zone, and it might be scarp retreat, but it definitely is a, a reminiscent of that type of process. You can also see remnants, what appear to be the remnants of a relaxed, a relaxed remnant of a crater over here. Uh, and Close-up images, uh, close-up views of uh, various sides of the planet show uh, lots of small crater structures here. So um, at least it's not featureless on the crater side, but as you can see, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there is a tremendous amount of geologic activity present, and uh, it's going to keep us very busy. Um, we, the center of the, uh, the North Pole is approximately where my cursor is uh, pointing right now. And, uh, and the sun angle is, the sun position is approximately over here. So what we can tell is in this zone, this structure here appears to be a cliff-like structure, south-facing, um, uh, 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 I guess, a cliff structure. And, uh, and what's interesting is that um, we see the same type of pattern on the upper bits, the bits that appear to be on the upper side of the of the cliff structure appear to be free of nitrogen frost, but in front 
where it's effectively cooler and of higher pressure likely because it's at a lower elevation we see uh, more frost deposits there. So that's one of the observations that was uh, made this morning um, by Leslie Young and um, uh, we had some other possibilities. This zone here we don't know exactly what it might be but it appears to be consistent with uh, appears to resemble what are called diapirs which are uh, mounds that um, gurgle up from beneath the surface. Um, you could think of it in a loose sense like a lava lamp. Um, uh, we see examples of these types of structures on the earth uh, when you have uh, salt gurgling up to the surface and it will form a mound on the surface. And that's what we're called diapirs. And we think that we're seeing um, uh, uh, indications of, of, uh, of morphology that's consistent with that, which is uh, very exciting for me, especially because I do uh, landform evolution modeling on the surface. So this is going to give me and, and uh, the other fellows who I work with uh, a lot to work with and a lot to think about from the physics side. It's very or, exciting. Or can yeah, tell us or can exactly I have a what your instruments are looking at at this very moment. Three billion miles away. Uh, well, it's the Lori instrument is on, I think, and then there's the Ralph Envik Pan too. So that would be. Oh, it's actually happening right now. That's right. If you see, see, we see the instruments on the left, and then we see. So both uh, Lori and Envik are active so you, you right see, now. see, as we speak, these images are being taken, and you see the. Um, and uh, this is incredibly exciting. I got to tell you, wow. It's happening. <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, wow, I, I'm tongue-tied. I don't know what to say. Uh, are there any questions? We can have a quick question. David, you want to chime in at some point soon? <laughs> this is what we live for. This is what we live I've for. I've got a question. Neil from New York. Hi, Neil. Uh, just a question. You were commenting on we all saw the high brightness contrast between the dark areas and the light areas, but um, could you actually quantify the relative albedos of those regions? Because you can clearly layer on a, a grayscale that would make something that's not as dark as that be as dark as that in, a, in an image. So, um, so we get some quantified sense of how reflective is the dark area yeah, relative um, to the light area. From uh, what I was, I mean, this has been already uh, discussed. I, I don't know if that data has been revealed yet, but uh, we're, we're talking approximately a, a, a peak reflectance would be a 50%, so a 50% albedo, down to the darkest regions appear to be showing a under 10%, if I have the number right, maybe a little. It's in that zone, approximately. So a factor, about a factor of five. About a factor of five. Between the brightest correct. areas and the darkest areas. Yeah. Because you could stretch, of course, the display to have the lightest area white and the darkest area come out black. Right. No, the display, as you're seeing in the images, as as flashed there for you, are exactly a linear, what we call a linear scale. So it's just a linear pixel count. So and and it's exactly it's similar to the, uh, the brightness level that um, we um, we're seeing. I'm sorry, it's a linear, not excuse me, it's a logarithmic scale done to be similar to what the eye sees. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we have a question from uh, Adler Planet Planetarium. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good morning, Orkin. We have a question from one of our Adler astronomers. Do you see any evidence of relaxation due to subsurface ocean in those craters? Oh. <laughs> um, you know, that's something that a lot of us have actually uh, entertained as a possibility. At this stage, we don't see such a thing. We don't see obvious evidence for that. Uh, but um, uh, who knows? Uh, this large basin that we appear to be seeing in the if you uh, can, we go back to the um, the, the uh, high resolution image that was released. Is that possible? Yeah, there we go. So if um, so, this this zone here. Oh, just a moment. We're making making laptops do the job of computer switches here, so it takes a little while to do it, but. Oh, are we good to go? Yeah. I think we're good to go. So this zone here, oh, how about I just point it out? 
this zone here. This, this, this okay, there we go. Okay, so this is this uh, this low lying latitude, uh, this low lying elevation zone. What appears to be low lying elevation zone. Uh, it has been conjectured by some in the crew that this may be an impact basin. Uh, uh, what it led to, we don't uh, necessarily know at this stage. But uh, if that is the case, this is a somewhat relaxed crater basin. If that is the case, because it shows the uh, it's consistent with the relaxation process, but as far as subsurface oceans are concerned and any evidence of that in terms of the surface landforms, at this stage, uh, Orkan, nothing is clear. Orkan, can you please um, uh, trace your cursor slowly over the image to show exactly where you were talking about things? So this is the, uh, the left side of the wing, and this is conjectured to be the, uh, the impact basin. And it, if so, it has definitely relaxed quite a bit. Um, and that's the only large-scale thing that we see that shows some evidence of relaxation. One might suggest that this area here, I'm tracing out my cursor, is also a relaxed crater zone. Uh, it looks consistent with it, but again, one can't be too sure. Perhaps this region as well, but uh, yeah, uh, we're going to wait for our three-dimensional reconstructions before we start saying anything definitive yet. Thanks for the Thanks question, for the question Mike. Mike. There's, there's also, also the ability, the ability to take questions, questions coming in through Twitter, Twitter and, and one came, came in from Rocket, Rocket Nuts. Nuts. One. one. Uh, uh, oh, no, yes. yes. Is there yes. a there slide, slide show some more pics as they, they come down? down. And Organ's going to answer that, but in reality, if you go to New Horizons at NASA.gov, I think. Uh, well, whatever is publicly released, you'll find it on uh, NASA.gov or the corresponding New Horizons page, which is run by Johns Hopkins University and APL. Uh, you would have to search on that to find it. But all of those images and all of the data that comes down, when they're made available public, you'll find it on that site. Uh, I think we're seven minutes away from closest approach. Oh, yes. And... Oh, yes. <laughs> and also, hey, um, <clears throat> Orkan, um, we were discussing um, yesterday um, how um, our knowledge of the distance of Pluto was the hardest number to get, so that um, New Horizons is actually reaching its closest approach point early. By yes. 70 seconds, is that correct? That's correct. And that is a testament to the skilled uh, scientists and engineers working on the navigation side of the story. Uh, I didn't work out a good comparison, but we're talking about... Yeah, I did. Oh, you did. Yeah, let's hear it. This let's one. hear it, Neil. Yeah, yeah let's hear so it. So I, I tweeted it a couple of days ago. Um, yeah? Yeah, I, just, I was thinking of the diameter of a, of a, of a golf cup on a putting green and how far the hole-in-one would have to be to yeah. land in the Gulf, yeah. so, uh, relative to launching from Earth and coming this close to Pluto. And it's, it's, it's hitting a golf ball two miles and then landing right in the cup. So <laughs> that, that, that num those numbers work out about the same as launching here from Earth. I think I heard uh, Alan Fort Stern Fort say something similar. It was uh, threading a needle from New York to L.A., Something along, along well, those okay. scales. So all I did was, so you, you, that's, that's a better calculation than mine, because all I did was say, uh, you know, what is the closest approach to Pluto, right? And it could be any, it could be even closer than this. If it was that, we'd still be happy. So yeah. I gave it some slop there. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it, but it's, I mean, it's still uh, a So if you want, if you want to a needle from New York to Cal, I'll take it. That's good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think we'll, so the closest we'll approach is actually 7,800 miles. From Pluto. Yes. Right. So all I did was take that distance yeah. and divide it over the 4 billion miles. And on a ratio that to the diameter of a golf cup. That's all exactly. I did. Exactly. And <laughs> that's all I did. In the simulation, once again, uh, we, we're actually seeing the uh, distance right here in readout in kilometers. So that's here. 
So very, and as you all well know, and it will be discussed a little bit more later, once we cross, once we cross across the closest point of the disk, we're going to get some nice occultation measurements with Pluto Michael? and Charon. And that's going to be also something quite amazing. We don't see that yet. That's coming down the line in about 20 minutes. Or no, less, excuse me, probably in the, how much time we have now? Seven uh, minutes. On, I'm just going to break in to just say that, uh, to tell Michael, can we stop moving around the spacecraft for a second? Michael, can you bring um, uh, the, uh, can you bring the space, you know, bring Pluto and, and Charon up a little higher? Can you bring Pluto and Charon up a little higher? Um, so it's not behind the spacecraft. Move away from new. Move, move away from New Horizons a little bit, please. Move away from New Horizons. Just a little bit. Just a little bit more. Okay, stop. Stop. Now, don't move. Don't move. <laughs> Pause. Okay, and the reason the reason we're doing this is we're trap. Okay, tell Michael to stop navigating, please. Um, and the reason for this is that what we can actually see is the m motion of the spacecraft. And I just want to point out that um, this is Arcturus, this is Spica, and over here is Coma Berenices. Uh, uh, so and over here is, is Scorpius. But the point is, is that if you're watching this, you can actually see the moray pattern here. And uh, that you can actually see the motion of the speed even from this distance. It seems very slow. It's almost like watching grass grow. But at this distance, of course, and this speed, it, it's in relative motion, somewhat slow. But we're actually now passing to the night side of Pluto. Yes. And this is the also farthest we object in the solar Pluto, system we've explored. We uh, werden also den Planeten quasi von hinten filmen. Was auch klar ist, uh, wir werden nicht... I can't hear you. We can see Pluto passing in front of stars as we go. Here we have MVIC. This is the Pan 1 camera on. MVIC actually uses called a TDI or time delayed imaging. And so that strip, they use the scanning, they use the uh, motion of the spacecraft. It's using uh, fuel, I believe hydrazine, so that it's just moving very slowly. And they have star trackers um, and they also uh, to. Um, know that their aiming is just right. Yeah. And then, so this is about to make its observation of Sharon here. Yeah. And also the glory camera as well. Okay, keep, uh, you can, uh, okay, you can keep going now, sorry. Michael, you can, you can navigate now, again. You may not navigate. Thank you. <laughs> we're, we're, going we're going to come back, back to, 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 to talk us through the closest approach. approach. This, this is going to be the, the ESPN play-by-play. Play. And then and astrobiologist, astrobiologist and author David Grinspoon is going to join us for some big, some big picture, picture thoughts, because uh, he's pretty psyched, too. <laughs> yeah! Back to, back to Orkin. Uh, well, here we go. We're... Uh, now doing a scan of Sharon. Can we uh, zoom in on it? See what we're going to be seeing on Sharon as well. And uh, so you can see now the, the frames that are being taken, stepping by step. And it's actually happening as we speak. And uh, yeah, and Sharon, uh, we could probably discuss it another time, but it also has very interesting structures on its surface as well. Uh, beyond just cratering, there appears to be some geology as well. And uh, now we're going to have this high resolution data, as I mentioned before, and we're going to be able to reconstruct those three dimensional topographic uh, images. And uh, so, and you see now the, the scan is now continuing off the disk and it's just taking those photos. And uh, now, how much time we have before closest approach? We have. Oh my God, I think it's about now. It's exactly now. We have just passed through closest approach. Yeah! Yeah, so there we go. Wow, we have now crossed 
over, in a sense, into the third zone. And it's a, a momentous, momentous occasion. Uh, I, uh, I'm kind of almost beside myself uh, with joy, and it's amazing. And the things that are going to be revealed to us uh, are uh, going to be quite unimaginable. Um, we are going into the third zone of the solar system, and this is going to be a place where new doors are going to open up, ways that I think none of us have imagined. And Pluto has opened that door for us already. We see that there are so many things we don't understand. And there it's staring right back at us as we, as we pass on through. Wow. Um, we, we have taken up a chunk of incredibly valuable scientist time. But you can see the reaction around the planet to this other planet that's out there and to the excitement that we all have about exploring it. Yeah. So I thank, please, everybody around the world, thank Orkin for joining us at this moment. He's going to go back and do more of what he loves doing, which yeah, is yeah. analyzing these pictures. And Talking David Grinspoon is going to join, join us as well. So thanks very much, Orkin. Oh, I really you. appreciate it. Uh, thanks, everybody. You can hear them clapping virtually around the planet. Awesome. Very good. Over to AM&H uh, for a little bit, and uh, David Grinspoon, who I know is well known to you guys, uh, is going to uh, take over and give us some commentary from here as well. Come on in, David. Not knocking the laptops off the table or spilling coffee on the computers. These are the nature. This is the nature of uh, real-time science. It still says all hand, but we'll fix that in just a second. So. Uh, What's it been, What's like, it been like, David? David? <laughs> wow. It's one of those moments. I remember being in fourth grade for the Apollo 11 landing on the moon and being 16 years old when Viking landed on Mars and uh, being a young postdoc during Voyager at Neptune. And, and those moments are etched into my brain. And I, I can feel that this is one of those moments now where we've, we've expanded our consciousness. We've reached... Another, not just another world, another another zone of, of reality of our of our universe, and uh, it's just amazing to be here with the people that are are making this happen and uh, experiencing um, the, uh, the the real time thrill of it all. Um, it, I, I'm not feeling very articulate because I'm a little bit overwhelmed, but um, uh, it's uh, it's so exciting um, and it's uh, it's very gratifying because these people on this mission are. Uh, my great friends from 20, 30 years ago that I went to grad school with, we were the kids, you know, and now it feels like uh, this is like our generation of planetary scientists, in a sense, and our mission. Uh, of course, it's multi they're all multi-generational, but I feel like a, a sort of torch being passed, and uh, it's just, I'm really proud of, of the team and the scientists, and I'm so excited, and, and just as a human being, I feel um, we have now um, expanded our uh, awareness of uh, the universe we live in, and uh, it's going to take a while to integrate, but um, it's uh, it, it's a wonderful moment, and I'm uh, I'm really happy, excited. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. So, tell us about how far this is, and how come we're not seeing pictures in seven minutes like the Mars spacecraft, <laughs> and why this visualization is so amazing. Yeah, yeah. All right, thanks for bringing me down to Earth, or, or Pluto. Pluto, Pluto. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> let's talk let's about talk what's happening. happening. I mean, it's interesting comparing this to, we just mentioned the Voyager encounters, which a lot of us, the, was the last time a lot of us experienced a new planetary encounter. This is a very different experience for several reasons. One, it's much farther away, as Jeff just mentioned. This is three billion miles away. So we don't have the sense of real time, um, we're getting the pictures back now. It's not as immediate um, of an experience as, as we had with Pluto, uh, with uh, Voyager at Neptune. But on the other hand, we are uh, have this new technology, thanks to Carter Emmert and all the people that have developed this visualization technology, where we're able to experience information and see these great graphics and see what's happening with Pluto and New Horizons right now. Michael, who's just off screen, wrote it all. And I, I'm just a so there's an immediacy, thanks to the 
the uh, web and the communications and the visualization technology that we didn't have for Voyager. And um, that uh, that's a different kind of experience. Am I on, Jeff? I think you're on. Okay. I don't hear uh, any feedback coming back from the other sites. Um, but uh, I'll just keep... Ex Okay, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so there's a sense in which it's more distant and, and we're more removed from it than we were at Voyager. You don't have the instant gratification of the pictures coming back. We have to wait until tomorrow morning to see the images from New, that New Horizons is collecting right now. But on the other hand, there's this virtual experience that we have that's much more immediate. And, and another thing is that with Voyager, there was a sense that you had to be there at JPL. If you were, those of us that were there inside the gates were the ones that saw the pictures. Now with the World Wide Web, I feel like we're all here together. You guys watching this and people uh, at their computers and watching the news, it's much more distributed as an experience. You don't have to be there in a certain place. We humanity are all there, all experiencing this encounter together. So there's ways in which it's more removed from us because of the distance, because it's a small spacecraft with a tiny antenna that can't both take data and talk to Earth at the same time. Um, and has to, we have to wait for those pictures to come all the way back and be sent down. But we have this real-time experience of being able to see what's happening and being able to all communicate with each other. And I think that's great. I feel like this is <laughs> the first post-human planetary encounter in a way we're using this augmented reality of our visualization and communication technology David David communicate with one another it's my fault so I have to just say David. one thing uh, and that is that CNN just sent out an alert which popped in on my iPhone saying that the closest approach was at 749 but CNN you're so 20th century we were there at Pluto <laughs> in real time several minutes ago. So thanks, Link Choping. Thanks, AMH. And, yeah. Welcome uh, to the 21st century. Jeff, can so you hear us? There's a que question from yeah. Neil. Yeah, oh, Jeff? Connor. Okay. I can't hear David, Carter. David, it's Carter. I don't have, um, I don't have anything. Okay. Oh, my headphones aren't plugged in. Yeah, I'm sorry. Plug it in. In his excitement, he pulled. It was it was operator terror. I was I was wondering David, why I wasn't hearing anything. David, can not Hi, Carter. Hi, Neil. On New Horizons. Okay. Yeah. David, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Hi, Neil. Hi, Carter. Hi, Denton. Yeah, yeah. Hi, hi, David. David, David, David. It's Carter. I. I, uh, I wanted to point out that your friend Paul Hackett is in the audience wearing his Neptune Encounter uh, t-shirt. Awesome. Hi, Paul. I'll stand up for a second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in the front row. And also, David, you touched on something that an anniversary today, that today, 50 years ago today, we got the first images back from a spacecraft at Mars with Mariner 4. So um, this is a nice anniversary to celebrate, 50 years of planetary exploration. So. And uh, just if I can tie a bow on some of what has been said, uh, I think, you know, I've, I've tussled with, with Alan Stern over Pluto's identity for many years, and uh, he, he kept trying to say, we need the, you know, the, we, we need to explore the, Last planet for the first time. You know, he had some he had some clever sort of ways of getting people excited about this, and I, I never thought of it as the last planet uh, for several reasons. But what I, I rather than thinking of completing the reconnaissance of the nine planets, uh, given our latter day knowledge that there's this Kuiper belt of other icy bodies in the outer solar system, I viewed it as the first exploration of a new swath of real estate in the solar system recently identified as the Kuiper Belt. And so, so that is far more open-ended than saying, let us complete the reconnaissance of the nine planets. And so, of course, we're agreeing that we need to explore a planet, uh, uh, explore Pluto. I've never been on the opposite side of that argument. But uh, just to, to, to feed into the verklempness of uh, David <laughs> and Harkin, uh, yes, it's to, to see a distant object for the first time is some of the 
oldest emotions humans have ever had ever since we left the cave. What is on the other side of that valley? What is on the, at the top of the mountain? Somebody gets to do that and come back and tell everyone about it. And do you go there? Do you pitch tent there? In those days, not everyone actually had that experience. It had to be communicated in some way. And then you would imagine it. Whereas here, just, just plugging right into what David was uh, sharing with us, um, the web has given all of us sort of equal access, uh, equal, um, equal chance to, to vicariously be the explorers ourselves. And, and given how much we have explored, it's not every day where we get to see something for the first time that has never been seen by another human being. So yes, this is a special moment. It is a special day with nine years of anticipation that had led up to it. I'm going to take a question. Thanks very much, uh, Neil. That's extremely well expressed. Uh, I have a question from uh, Bolzano in Italy. David Gruber, go ahead. Yeah, it's not a question from me per se, but from uh, one of the uh, students that uh, joined us here. And he's, uh, it's Julian, and he's asking you now. Could we discover new moons using New Horizons? So that was a question, could we discover new moons starring uh, using New Horizons? What's happened so far, David? Yes, yes absolutely. absolutely. Um, that is one of the, uh, one of the things that the, uh, the team is going to be looking for very carefully, um, especially after Encounter is some of the best opportunity because when you look back at the Pluto system as we're receding away and you're looking back more towards the sun, the angle is actually really good for discovering small objects because you get this scattering effect where uh, you know like when you're looking at your through your windshield at the at sunset and the dust gets really bright and it's hard to see because it's what we call forward scattering when the when the uh, sun angle is uh, you're looking almost from behind the object is when uh, it, it things become very clear so we'll be looking for small objects and even rings which are basically rings or lots and lots of little moons um, to be sure they'll be looking for uh, different kinds of smaller objects in orbit around New Horizons and hopefully we'll find some and uh, of course um, hopefully the actual path of the New Horizons spacecraft is completely free of any uh, small um, objects or debris because there's still this question of, of, of a hazard and we're not uh, you know we're not out of the woods yet it's well the spacecraft is uh, hopefully presumably but we'll know about this at about uh, nine o'clock tonight so yes we want to find more small objects around the uh, around Pluto I bet we will and um, knock on wood we won't find any right in the uh, path where uh, New Horizons is uh, currently uh, speeding actually right now speeding away from Pluto uh, David, uh, this is Carter, and uh, it's just uh, one of the design criteria for the trajectory was to actually go, th uh, pass through very close to Charon's orbit um, around Pluto or around the Barry Center. They both orbit that, and because it's thought that Charon would sweep out any possible debris, uh, because uh, they had discovered with the Hubble Space Telescope both Nix and Hydra, but then later uh, Mark Showalter discovered with further uh, Hubble telescope campaigns, uh, both Styx and Kerberos. And um, so then the thought was that they'd be finding more satellites, and so they've done a campaign to find them, but they haven't located any more. Um, but uh, they, as a precautionary measure, the spacecraft uh, had to go through essentially where they thought that would be swept clear in Charon's orbit, but on the opposite side of Pluto. That's why we see them together in the visualization. And then also pass through the shadows of both Pluto and Charon so that they look back. And we're, we're about to be lining up to see some of that uh, in, in the coming uh, uh, tens of minutes. Yeah, it's, it's a very clever sequence. And as, uh, as Carter's just very nicely expressed, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, clever geometry that's gone into both the safe path by using the fact that um, that uh, Charon is kind of a uh, a mind sweeper, if you will, gravitationally in the system. So we know we we can bet there's a, a 
pretty safe corridor there. And then also this business of uh, we're about to pass through the shadows of both Pluto and then Charon, and that is, um, you know, both will probably visually be really neat, but also it allows us to do some really cool science by creating these artificial eclipses and these occultations so that we can um, learn new things about the planet by seeing what happens when we fall into the shadow and there's certain kinds of observations that we can make of the atmospheres and of the uh, the edge um, of the planet as you go into space and of the, mag the magnetic uh, field, um, how, the, how the, uh, they're disturbing the uh, solar magnetic field. All of this you can learn by this passage through the shadows. David, I, I'm just pointing out that you can see the Barry Center. If you ask uh, Michael, well, um, Michael's actually got it pretty well here. So we see the orbit of Pluto around the balance point between Charon and Pluto, and that's what that little floating blue um, target is between. So that's, that's the Barry Center. And so Pluto actually orbits that. By the way, uh, our moon does not orbit the center of the Earth. Our moon and Earth orbit their common center of mass, which is a thousand miles beneath Earth's surface in a line between the center of Earth and the center of our moon. So they basically do a kind of a dance, a choreography. Um, I can think of it as a, a cosmic ballet choreographed by the forces of gravity. Yeah, uh, and, and what's cool about the uh, Pluto and uh, Charon system, system is that they do that same kind of dance, dance, but because the ratio of their masses is so much less extreme than the ratio of the Earth-Moon, that center of gravity is actually outside, as Carter said, of either body, so they're actually, it's, a, it's, it's truly a kind of double planet doing this dance in space, and one thing that we're really keying in double on... Double dwarf planet. Yes. <laughs> One thing that we're keying Jupiter, in on Jupiter here. Jupiter and the is, Sun have a Barry Center outside of the Sun. There's this interesting possibility that they may be sharing an atmosphere, that Pluto's atmosphere is streaming off into space. We know this, but some of it may be getting sucked up by its giant moon, Charon. And some of what we're seeing on the surface of these objects may actually have to do with the dynamics of gas flowing from one to another. Uh, and so this is a really exciting thing we're going to try to puzzle out. Does this double planet system actually have a, uh, do, they, do they share an atmosphere? And is there some weird dynamics going on where gas is leaving Pluto and depositing on Sharon? Does that have something to do with this dark pole that we're seeing on Sharon? We have so many more questions than answers now, but we know that we're seeing interesting phenomena. Have, uh, you know, we're gonna, it's going to take us some years to puzzle, puzzle all this out. For the, uh, the scene direction for a moment here, uh, because Fran Bagenall, one of the leading researchers on the mission, has just broken away from real-time observations of downstairs, and David is going to move away, and while they switch seats, I'm going to fill the gap by answering a couple of the Twitter questions that came in. So where can we find the open source software that Carter was showing on the live stream? I believe if you go to the AMH website for breakfast at Pluto, you will find a link from there. Or if not, I'm sure oh, they'll you. add that. We, we, we showed that, Jeff, uh, in the intro, um, but I'll just mention it again. It's open space as one word. So openspace.itn.liu. Dot SE. And this is a pre-release of the software that will be visualizing our greater digital universe. And also, we're working with NASA Goddard for space weather and visualizing that process. And this is exactly Fran Bagenal's area of expertise. And so we're looking at working further with Fran from the results of this mission to visualize the plasma and particle environment of the solar winds interaction with the atmosphere of Pluto. Hi, Fran. Hi. Uh, she is, of course, not David Grinspoon. That would be a rather magical transformation. I will change the name very soon so that she is not embarrassed. We, we are delighted to have Fran with us. Um, and uh, she is going to start off by telling us what happened here at APL during the moment of closest approach. Uh, my Sorry, say that again, Frank. Oh, we had 
mayhem because everybody had a great time yelling and shouting and counting down and jumping up and down and hugging and it was uh, a great celebration by lots of people all just enjoying the fact that you know the spacecraft the new horizon spacecraft was at closest approach at that very second now of course what we really want is to find out that it survived flying through and send back a hello um, we're okay and start sending the data back and we'll hear about that tonight so just have to wait a little bit longer and we'll get that home safe message. Fran, Neil Tyson here in New York City just to be yeah. clear um, if at that instant um, New Horizons slammed into some undocumented um, space rock uh, we, we would not have known about three or four it. No, hours. no. Right. Yeah. We would not hear right. it. We'd find out like in a few nine, hours. Nine, nine o'clock, I believe. Nine o'clock. Well, yes, because right, right, not only as we've, have we got this four and a half uh, hour light time, travel time, communication time, we've also got the fact that the spacecraft is going around doing click click. As you can see with the fantastic stuff that you're seeing on the, on the sky uh, in your planetaria, that, you're, that it's busy doing other stuff, but it will call home and it will tell us that everything is okay um, later and we'll hear about that in a while. So we just have to Driving keep down our fingers crossed, crossed in the meantime. We have a question coming in from Brisbane, so go ahead Brisbane. Yes, thank you. And, uh, just before I do, on a human side of things, uh, we have a uh, staff member here in Brisbane, Carter knows her, uh, her and she was born in the same month and year as uh, Clyde Tombaugh discovered, did his discovery imaging of uh, Pluto, taking those plates in January of 1930. So, uh, anyway, the questions we have: uh, one person wants to know when will uh, New Horizons exceed the distance, if it will exceed the distance of Voyager One, launched in 1977. And the second question is that if any of the discoveries that are coming in are going to influence the sort of the profile of the planning for New Horizons, what's left in its mission? So the first question is, it, it is very straightforward, that Voyager is off and is moving faster. And the reason it's moving faster is that it not only got a kick at Jupiter, but also at Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. So Voyager 2 is, is certainly it got a little less of a kick at Neptune, but it's got a lot more kick than, than uh, New Horizons did at Jupiter. So it's moving faster. Voyager 1, not quite so much, but... Um, New Horizons will not overtake, it's moving slower. But it will move out into the outer solar system and we hope it's going to fly by uh, another Kuiper Belt object, a smaller, very different one. That's the hope. Uh, and then uh, we will, um, you know, who knows how long it will keep going, but we've been talking about into the 30s. Uh, we'll be measuring the solar wind, the charged particles and don't forget that the student dust counter will be measuring debris from the breakup of the objects in the outer solar system. So the student dust counter will be telling us about how these objects bump into each other and generate pieces of, of dust, micron sort of size, very small pieces of dust. But Fran, I think part of the question was intended to learn whether New Horizons will ever overtake the Voyager spacecraft as having the distinction of the farthest most object that we've ever sent. No, that, that won't happen um, because Voyager is moving faster and set off earlier. So uh, it's got a head start and New Horizons is moving fast but not as fast and so it can never catch up. But it could end up being the farthest object that we still have contact with. Okay. We'll see. It, it depends a bit on, on the lifetime. And the reason why I'm saying that is the uh, uh, Voyager has more power and more communication capability um, than New Horizons, so it's not clear how long we will continue to be able to communicate with New Horizons. It's going to be decades, which is great. Let's not get into this furthest, biggest thing. That's what newspapers make headlines about. That's why I make this comment. Sorry, sorry. They make a big deal. So, so since we have Fran with us, there's actually a question from uh, Italy again, 
with a rather technical question about cosmic particles and their impacts on New Horizons. So I'm going to go over to Italy to pose that question and over to you, Bolzano. Yeah, it's again us. Thank you. And there's another student with the tech question. Please go ahead. So I wanted to ask if uh, cosmic particles influence the instruments or the measurements, and if yes, if there still is a possibility of calibrating the instruments. So cosmic particles. You could sorry, sorry. Look. Go ahead. Go ahead. You could interpret cosmic particles in a variety of ways, in terms of actual chunks of dirt. Um, we are measuring those with. Uh, the student does counter, and it's on the order of one every few days, and these are micron-sized pieces of dust. So we know the amount of that out there, and it's not really damaging the spacecraft. Um, so there is a, a minor possibility, a very slight possibility, that a lot we will run into a couple of that object, but that's extremely unlikely. Actually, it's very empty out there. On the other hand, there are cosmic rays, energetic particles that come from beyond our solar system out into the planetary medium from our galaxy that are very energetic particles and they do come in and hit the spacecraft and they hit the electronics, they hit the de cameras and the detectors and we see that as noise in our instruments and the spacecraft behavior. But, you know, um, We've survived, and we continue to survive, and hopefully we will. We have some fault protection systems in there. We have some uh, redundancy, and so uh, we will, I'm sure, we continue to be bombarded by these energetic particles, but um, so far we've uh, been able to survive. I hope that answers your question. You've been subject to really cosmic rays the entire voyage, right? It's not just particularly a Pluto. That's right. That's right. right. We've been measuring uh, the solar wind particles at lower energies, um, the energetic particles that come from the sun, as well as the uh, ionized material that comes in from the interstellar medium. We measure that as uh, ions that are picked up in the solar wind. And so um, we've been measuring a variety of particles with Swap and Pepsi. And then the uh, UV instrument and the cameras uh, are also sensitive to energetic electrons and, and particles, and they can detect them. But in those cases, it's more noise than signal. I'm, I'm going to get a jump. I'm going to jump, jump in again, again and, and ask our friend friends to stay, stay here for a moment. Can you stay for a moment? Sure. Uh, but Kathy Olkin has just joined us. Kathy is the deputy project scientist. And she and uh, Fran represent the Alice instrument. I'm going to say that because we've got Randy. I'm just joking. We've got Randy and uh, Joel Parker here who are going to talk about the Alice instrument. I was making a, a segue to say that so far you've heard from a lot of male investigators, but a substantial portion of the scientists and engineers on New Horizons are female. And Kathy has been part of some uh, work to reach out to students to make sure that the role models that the New Horizons team represents are there. So I'm going to give my headset to both Fran and Kathy and have them talk a little bit about the teamwork involved. And hopefully we can have a duet between Fran and Kathy uh, at the front here. You're going to see the wrong names, but uh, join us, Kathy. I'm going to get off my seat. OK. This is real time. <laughs> International production here. Yeah. Move yeah. your right a little bit. Does anyone know where my coffee went? Is my coffee? Is that my coffee? Yeah, okay. I can hear. Early. So now, there we go. Dynamic Hi, duo. Yes, yay. 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 Answer whatever intelligent questions come in from anybody on Earth. <laughs> Far away. Yep. We have a question from the, in the American Museum. How you how uh, how we picked the, how the mission scientists picked where to look. Where to look? Yeah. Where to look? We look everywhere. The image targeting. I, th so I think I, I think I know which one. Everywhere. That's right. Well, we had uh, science goals that we had to accomplish. And so 
some of them had to be done from a particular range to itself, and that meant that we have to be at a certain time. And so uh, our science goals dictated when we looked at each target with different instruments. But why was the, why were the Neil Tyson here? Uh, why were the high resolution image gone across uh, uh, across longitudes rather than pole to pole? It seems to me if you want to get high resolution images, it might be more interesting to go pole to pole instead of sort of horizontally across. Yeah, well, that has to do with how the instruments take the data. So um, the Ralph instrument scans across Pluto, and there's an uncertainty in where Pluto is, and that uncertainty extends um, side to side and not up and down. So in order to cover the error ellipse, we had to start off on one side, scan across that, and then keep going. And to maximize our science return, we're observing with the Ralph instrument and the Lori instrument simultaneously so that's why the strip of the high resolution Lori images that you see right here go across in that direction. It was to maximize the science return. Thank you for that. I have another question from the M&H. Uh, this is from William and Henry, age five. When did scientists first see the heart on Pluto and what do they think it is? And then why is Pluto so cold? Well, I can answer why it's so cold. Okay. Two reasons. Now that's the easy one. One is it's a long way from the sun, right? So 33 times further than the Earth from the sun. And so the solar heat decreases with distance as you move away from the source of heat. And it goes as a distance squared. So 33 times further away, 1,000 times less heat coming from the sun. But there's another reason, and that's because it's white, like snow. And that reflects. So the sunlight goes all the way out there, and then it just gets reflected. So there are black regions, and the black regions will be warmer because they absorb the heat that comes from the sun. That was a, what was the other question? The other part was about when we saw the heart. Oh, yes. So we, we just saw it not that long ago, really. Um, it was basically the day before we released it to the public. We had to, you know, take a look at it and get it out to people. So it hasn't been that long that we could see that feature as a heart. Um, from the ground, we had seen for years that there was a brighter patch on that part of Pluto, but we had no idea its extent, and so it wasn't until New Horizons got close enough to resolve it that we could see the shape of it. It could have been the shape of a dog. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, it's, it's now being called an eagle. Uh, Okay. Uh, if, everybody everybody I'll, sees I'll, different I'll things. I'll throw another question. Um, this is a more, this is perhaps a more philosophical question uh, uh, from someone in our audience. What do you hope this project inspires, particularly with the next generation of scientists? To go back out and explore more objects. I mean, there's thousands of objects out there to go look at. I mean, this isn't the end of our exploration of our solar. Just because we checked off Pluto doesn't mean we stop. I agree. And I By hope the way. Just, I hope it oh, inspires sorry. people to go and do what they're passionate about. Just like we're passionate about exploring Pluto. And if you want to learn more about things, no matter what it is, uh, science, technology, art, English, anything, pursue your passions. Or French. Or French, or Italian. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we ask a question also from Hamburg? Yeah. Or German? Uh, yes, sure. <laughs> sure. Um, when I was growing up, I I'm old enough to say this, that missions to the planets were primarily uh, flybys, and the Voyager flybys uh, were sort of principal among them. 
And it was not until later that we really started having many more spacecraft go to a destination and then hang out there, go into orbit and stay there and collect data uh, with a higher sort of return on the investment of the time it took the spacecraft to arrive. So could, can you comment on why this is a flyby rather than uh, a hangout? <laughs> <laughs> what, was it was it a matter of you couldn't bring enough fuel to slow down for going that fast, or did you really want to go out to the Kuiper Belt after this and see what else what else is there to notice? So primarily the issues are distance, and the three biggies with spacecraft are propulsion to get there and stop, uh, power to fuel the instruments and the communication, and thirdly, communication. So we had a choice when we were designing this mission. It's the first time we're going out to the Kuiper Belt. We need to do basic reconnaissance. What's there? What does it look like? Just get the, the first basic stuff. The way that Voyager did at, at Jupiter, the, those first pictures of Eo with the volcanoes and Ganymede with the, with the impact craters and the cracks and the stuff, and the great red spot and the fantastic clouds and stuff. Okay, so we wanted to do the same with Pluto, that first characterization. So we had a choice of taking: do we take instruments or do we take fuel? And to be honest with you, we could not have taken enough fuel to get into orbit around Pluto. So it was really quite an easy issue to decide. So once you decide you're doing a flyby, you have to decide, do you go there fast and soon, get there quicker, and then recognize you've got to be really fast in going click, 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 click as you go by to take your data. And yes, it's going to take longer to send the data back. Now. I asked Glenn Fountain, who's the mission manager, this question, and I've been thinking this. The one thing that I wish we had beefed up on this spacecraft is indeed the antenna to send the data back a little quicker. And I think we all feel it would be better to have made a slightly bigger antenna, to put a bit more power into the sending the data back. But Orbiter, forget it. There's no way we could have done that. It's, it's, it's too, too small, too small an object, too far away. And, and just to clarify, in case it wasn't obvious, yes, when we think of fuel, we normally think of fuel to make you go faster, but then you also need fuel to slow down, which is an unfamiliar Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Lives, because we rely on friction to slow us down in the car, for example. Take your foot off the accelerator, your car slows down. Uh, in this enterprise in space, where there is no friction, you need fuel to slow down. So there you go. Uh, I'm going uh, to jump in here for a moment. Uh, we're, in the uh, we're in the last half hour uh, of our broadcast, uh, hanging out, and, out. and we've got, we've got some other scientists who are here. here. So thank you very much, for Sure, it. pleasure, excellent. pleasure. For Hi guys. Uh, <laughs> So we are bringing on the aforementioned Alice team. Mm -hmm. However, I'm going to ask them one at a time. So Joel first. That way I won't identify you as Fran Bagenor for too long. We'll get it changed up. <laughs> but they've just done their observations. And so that's what they're going to talk about. So this is Joel Parker, Alice Instrument. I'm just going to ask him to introduce his instrument while I bring his name up. So yes, let me introduce Alice. Uh, Alice is an ultraviolet spectrometer that is on the spacecraft. Uh, we have several, several of these Alice ultraviolet spectrometers on other instruments as well. And uh, so Alice is right now making an occultation observation where the sun is setting behind Pluto, and we're watching it. The sun goes really high, and we get a very sensitive measure of the atmosphere. Uh, 
Joel, this is Carter. Um, Hi, Carter. Also, we can see in the visualization um, the Rex uh, line of sight, a radio science, and we see that in the visualization as a yellow flashing line of sight between the high gain antenna and the deep space network, which I guess uh, is beaming toward the spacecraft, but it beamed toward the spacecraft for the spacecraft to be picking that up about, well, four and a half uh, hours ago for the light travel time. That's right. So uh, New Horizons was designed to do this dual occultation, which is very interesting. So while Alice is staring at the sun, unlike what your mother maybe told you, don't look at the sun, we designed Alice to look at the sun, and the Rex instrument at the same time is looking at Earth. So they beamed up a uh, radio signal from the Earth that Rex will receive and it will measure that radio signal much in the same way that Alice is measuring the light from the Earth. So you can think of or light from the Sun. So you can think of the Sun beamed up some photons and uh, the Deep Space Network beamed up its radio signal and we're going to be measuring those at two different wavelength regions as Pluto basically passes through those signals. So this is what's called an occultation. That's right, occultation. So uh, when one thing's going in front of something else, and uh, we do occultations from the ground as well. In fact, Pluto's atmosphere was discovered from an occultation from ground-based observatories. If you have a nice bright star that Pluto happens to pass in front of, Pluto creates a shadow that goes across if you're lucky, the face of the Earth, and you can actually measure the light of that star as it dims and goes behind Pluto. If Pluto had no atmosphere, then the light of that star would blink out right away, and then it would flash back on when the star came out the other side. What they saw instead of that sudden blink out was there was a gradual decrease in the light before the star disappeared. And that was the key discovery that Pluto had an atmosphere. And so what will the ALICE instrument tell you using ALICE and Rex together about the atmosphere of Pluto that, that, that's new? So ALICE and Rex will be doing a much more sensitive measure than we've been able to do from the ground. Uh, stars can be pretty bright and we've had some bright stars go behind Pluto but this observation is going to be of the brightest star we've seen go behind Pluto yet so the Sun is uh, delivering a lot of photons to our instrument that gives us a really good signal to noise so this really allows us to do a very detailed measurement of the light dimming behind the atmosphere and we can watch as the light dims and we can also look to see in the spectrum. Remember Alice is an ultraviolet spectrograph so it breaks that ultraviolet light up into an ultraviolet rainbow and different atoms and molecules have different fingerprints in that rainbow. So when we look at that rainbow we can see how it changes. We could actually measure as the Sun passes through Pluto's atmosphere, how it changes, what things are absorbing at different altitudes above Pluto. So we'll be able to measure, and uh, with Alice, we'll really be able to look at a very fine scale here. As it passes through the atmosphere, uh, what the scale heights are for uh, different properties in the atmosphere. So it's going to be a much better measure than any of the occultation experiments we've done in the past. I have a question here that came in through Google Plus and Twitter. Has the New Horizons spacecraft discovered evidence of a shared atmosphere between Pluto and Charon? Probably uh, premature, but these guys are the people to answer that. So we, we have not seen evidence of a shared atmosphere yet, but there are certainly predictions that uh, Pluto learned to share, and some of the atmosphere from Pluto may indeed get delivered 
to share it. And the question is, if that happens, what's what's the impact? Uh, to use the term, and what's involved? Does Sharon uh, hold on, and uh, is there a transient atmosphere on Sharon that's perhaps shared? We will actually be able to measure that because I've been talking about the Pluto occultation. We are actually also going to go through the shadow of Sharon as well. So the Alice instrument is going to be able to make a very, very sensitive measure to see if there is some type of transient atmosphere around Sharon. And Pluto may have delivered some of the uh, richness of its atmosphere to Sharon and on Sharon's surface. So there might be clues there as well. So there's a number of different lines we could look at to try to measure how much of the atmosphere from Pluto might have been delivered to Sharon. I'm going to ask uh, Joel to say what is Alice doing right now and then to throw it to Randy Gladstone, one of his collaborators, to continue the discussion of the instruments. So what is Alice doing three billion miles away right now? Alice is doing exactly what we told it to do. Uh, if you look on this image here, you'll see that Alice has an unusual shape to its field of view. There's like this big square box and then a long slot underneath. It, we call it a lollipop. It kind of looks like a lollipop. And uh, the sun has been, we've designed the observations so the sun will be in the large box area. And it's about a two degree square box. And so we are letting the sunlight come to the Alice instrument. And we're actually, we're actually looking, looking through, through not the main, main aperture, aperture of Alice, 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 but a little aperture that's off the side, side that has a little manhole. Because the sun, in fact, is so bright, we so can't look at the main, main aperture. aperture. So the sunlight's sunlight coming through that manhole. Through our slit, the box, the box is the large, large part. part. And then it goes uh, to our detector where we get the spectrum. So Alice right now is madly collecting photons, counting them at fractions of a second to really get a very good time sequence of how the brightness of the sun changes in the ultraviolet as it goes behind Pluto. We have a, a question here at the museum uh, in New York. Um, how do you compensate for the speed of the spacecraft in both, uh, of course, the camera exposures, but also in, in your experiment? So you have to you have to account for any relative speed just by uh, you know where the spacecraft is going to be. You know where the sun is, uh, and so you have to be sure that you are tracking the sun. You make those calculations and you program the spacecraft to do the attitude control to track where it's supposed to track. So uh, it's all math and programming uh, to make sure that you're pointing at the right place at the right time. And as far as the exposure is concerned, uh, there are uh, two ways you can do it. One, if you're going to take basically just a snapshot, uh, if you have an estimate of how bright your object is, so you have some, uh, you don't really have a live photo photometer there to tell you how to adjust your exposure, but you can estimate it. And so you can estimate how long to make your exposure. But the method that Alice is using right now is something we call pixel list, or it's a time tagged uh, observation. So every photon that comes in has a time tagged with it. And we just keep track of all those photons and when they come in. And then when we get the data on the ground, which is this long string of photons, where they landed and what time, we can then reconstruct the whole timeline of what happened during that observation. Thanks very much, Joel. We're Thank going to you. switch to Randy Gladstone, who is one of the international partners <laughs> on the mission. Randy, somewhere I have lost your name super. So please introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Randy Gladstone, and 
the joke about international is that I'm a token Canadian on the team. Even though I live in the U.S., I in, uh, stayed Canadian, so anyway. Most Canadians live in the U.S., I've come to learn. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm told we have some more questions from New York. Oh, we do? Um, we actually have a stack of questions sitting right we, in front we, of him. Yeah. We, yes, we do. Um, one of the questions we have is, and, and um, I know the Alice instrument would be involved, is it, is it possible at this time, or will it be possible in five hours, to determine if there are, are any cryovolcanoes either on Karen or on Pluto? You mean cold volcano? <laughs> yeah. Why didn't you say a cold volcano? Of cold volcano. Thank you. Ice volcano. Isn't that better than cryo volcano? Yeah, cryo volcano. You communicate with people here. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> fine. Thank you. <laughs> Geologist, I like keep trying to train them how to speak. Okay. That's the question. We proceed, sir. Okay. Please. Well, you know, my my expertise is atmosphere, so I'll let the Ge geologists and geophysicists address that one, but I would be really thrilled to see something like that. We're expecting maybe to see some plumes because we think Pluto's sort of like Triton, and Triton had interesting plumes that were probably powered by uh, sunlight. So we're going to be looking at all these great new pictures that we get down and to see if we see streaks on the surface or some indication that there's atmospheric processes modifying the surface. So, so that's a, so that's a question that also came in. Uh, Pluto. Pluto. Does Pluto have a warm core? A warm core would potentially be driving those geysers, those geysers and, and that's, and to, that's be, to be seen in the images that are going to come back in the next few months. So that's, so that's to, to be determined. I, I, is, is there some motivation to think that Pluto would be would have a warm center? Uh, that's a good what, question. What would motivate too. that? Because Pluto is tidally locked, so you wouldn't expect stress on its physical body the way we've had on Io and other sort of warmed moons of the exactly. solar system. Yeah. So, As I understand, I understand it, it, it shouldn't really be, be uh, warm uh, inside at this point. Uh, uh, we don't know. We don't know. There could be, there could other, be sources. other sources of heat. But, but yeah, 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 I think that it, yeah, I, I would expect, I would expect it to be completely cold, cold inside. And we see the plumes or cryovolcanism. Uh, might be, uh, might be solar, driven, solar driven, as on Mars. The, uh, you know, spiders you see on Mars. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, from the American Museum again, what do you, what do you expect to see in the atmosphere of, of Pluto, and what would surprise you to find in the atmosphere of Pluto? Okay. Sorry? Oh, I missed that. What, oh, the question what would surprise uh, you in the atmosphere of Pluto if you found something there? Oh, what would surprise me? Oh, well, lots what of things. What do you expect and what would surprise, uh, surprise you? I'm hoping to see a lot of minor constituents with the solar occultation data that should be finishing up in about two minutes or something for the sunset observation. Uh, but we only know of three things that are there right now, uh, nitrogen, Methane and carbon monoxide are the only things we really know are in the uh, atmosphere of Pluto. Uh, that methane should be processed by ultraviolet sunlight into many, many uh, higher order hydrocarbons and nitriles. And those things are supposed to hang out in the atmosphere long enough and uh, to build up to quantities we would be able to detect with the ALICE spectrograph. Uh, jumping in, Tell us what we're seeing in real time. What is the spacecraft doing? What is Alice gearing up to do right now? This is quite a view. I've never seen this one before, but according to my schedule, uh, we're just finishing the, the ingress of the solar occultation. So uh, the sun should be going behind Pluto, as seen from the spacecraft soon. Then it'll, uh, the instrument, I believe, will take a break and shut itself off and turn itself back on in time for the egress that starts in about 10 minutes or so and goes on for another half an hour. Uh, we are, uh, you know, the reason we turn it off is just in case something went wrong on the spacecraft or the instrument, we'd be able to start up again and, and get the egress, uh, and even if we lost the ingress. So it's all, uh, you know, planned to be autonomous as possible, uh, but we're 
hopefully have got at least the first part of all this great data set we're looking forward to getting uh, to explain the atmosphere. So Carter and uh, all the folks at Lynn Shopping, I hope you're pleased to hear one of the Alice researchers say he'd never seen his instrument doing what you can now see it doing. That's a pretty neat concept. So thanks to all of you guys for bringing the unvisualizable to visualizationable, putting too many syllables in there. Apologies, everybody. Uh, anyway, uh, questions from around the world. Do we have something from uh, Italy again? It looks as if you're gearing up to ask something. Is that true, David? Uh, for the moment, uh, yeah. uh, sorry. I went to the wrong one. Hey, I went to, to go to, to Brisbane. To ask a question also from Hamburg at some point? Oh, uh, certainly. Uh, let's have a question from Hamburg. Go ahead, Thomas. Um, well, you, you were talking about the similarities of Triton. Wouldn't you think then that Triton, the, the moon of Neptune, is like a Kuiper object that's like. Uh, caught by Neptune, and so, and the second part of the question is, uh, there is obviously not many craters on Pluto. What do you uh, conclude from that? So, not many craters on Pluto, so it means a young surface, and, and the similarity with Triton. Is Triton uh, an object uh, as part of the Kuiper belt? Would you see it's uh, like, like, Neptune, uh, like Pluto? When this line breaks, that's when we have Earth set behind Pluto. It will be in Pluto's shadow. <clears throat> there it is. We're in Pluto's shadow now. It's pretty long. Someone from the audience here decided to uh, get Dante-esque on us and say that we just entered the shadow of the depths of the underworld. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> Great. You're, you're back. You dropped off, Jeff. Very good. Uh, so a question from Brisbane. Don't forget Lynn Shipping. They want to ask questions, too. Uh, uh, yes. What uh, happened our question? Hello? What happened with, what happened with our question? Sorry. Well, I, I, did, did, did you answer it? I had to the first part that I, I think Triton was probably a captured object, too, and Dave might know. Or Is that correct? Sorry. Yes, really yeah, I, I think I believe that uh, Triton is believed to be captured. Yes. So, did that answer your question, Thomas? One second. No. What about the craters on craters? Oh yeah, uh, the young surface. Again, I, I can't comment on the youth of the surface, but uh, one thing that modifies the surface is the loss of nitrogen ice to space. Uh, F, over the age of the solar system, just from the loss of. Uh, uh, escape of nitrogen from Pluto, you'd expect almost a kilometer, possibly, of, of nitrogen ice has been removed from Pluto's surface. So that's, you know, a process that modifies it. Just And just the seasonal ch uh, transfer of ice from one polar cap to the other will modify the surface features. So craters don't have to last forever on Pluto. They can get resurfaced pretty easily, I think. We're going to go to a question from Sweden. Oh, boy. Professor Anders? <laughs> Anders! <laughs> Where are you, Sweden? Oh. Okay. How about Ghana? Do we have Ghana? I'm afraid Ghana is a Ghana. Um, <laughs> <laughs> however, while we're waiting for Sweden to come back on, I'm crying. let's go to Brisbane. Uh, yes, uh, I think we're going to overlap on some things. Someone had wanted to know uh, how we compare Triton to, to Pluto. Someone also wanted to know whether where Neil was talking about the 
the atmosphere of Pluto before, would you more likely compare it to a coma of a comet? Uh, in the case of Pluto's atmosphere, is it that tenuous? Uh, so a couple of questions there. OK, uh, comparing it to a comet, it is escaping very rapidly. Uh, but I don't think of it as a comet exactly. It, it's, it hangs on to a lot of its atmosphere. I mean, I'm surprised that it still has volatiles there to, uh, to uh, escape, because uh, at the current escape rate, you would lose the atmosphere in about 10,000 years on Pluto. So it's constantly being replenished from surface frost. Uh, but yeah, it, it definitely is a, a, you know, hard for Pluto to hang on to it. And that you mentioned earlier, a different question was, uh, does Pluto share an atmosphere with Charon? And, and that's quite likely that uh, whatever atmosphere we do see in the next couple of hours, I guess when we go uh, do our Charon occultation, uh, will be very good uh, measure of how much they share between them. Thanks very much, Randy. Really appreciate your contribution. And wrapping up our two hours, David Grinspoon is going to come back with some syntheses. Um, I was told that... Oh, so Jeff, I'd like to interject briefly. Jeff, can you hear me? I can hear you, and yeah. I will shut up while yeah. you speak. No, that's, that's not... <laughs> uh, I just had to interject this. Uh, my daughter at this moment uh, is in Japan studying Japanese language and culture, and she said, fun Japanese fact, the word for Pluto is dark king star. And if that's not cool, I don't know what is. That is very cool. <laughs> dark king star. So, yeah, I want to start calling it that from now on. David, welcome back. Hello there. Plug uh, in your... Yes, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I... I can hear you this time. I'm I'm a little bit calmed down, and I'm like capable of basic physical uh, functioning with machines now. <laughs> I think we're winding down the program. Is that correct, Jeff? What? How long is the link open here? Uh, we could go on for another six hours, uh, according oh, to oh. Google I, Hangouts. I'm frozen. But basically, I would we're... like to point out. To I would like to point out that at three minutes before the hour, and we're wrapping at nine o'clock. Um, 9 a.m. here, local time, because we have a global audience. But at three minutes before the hour, we are due to pop out of Pluto's shadow. So we will have tr uh, gone through Pluto's shadow. I also wanted to say that even though we've had a limited number of participants, and some have been on our Google Hangouts and dropped off, um, together we've had, uh, uh, as a list, we've had Monmouth University in New Jersey, we had Chicago Adler Planetarium. We had Houston's Planetarium at the Houston Museum of Natural Science. Uh, we also had Buenos Aires, Buenos Aires, Argentina, and um, and then in Europe, oh, right, of course. Right. I just if, want I want to go if through you this. Want to say Buenos Aires? When you say Argentina. Okay. Well, okay. if you're okay, going to pronounce great. it, thank you. And um, also, also Singapore. Uh, Singapore has been online as well as. Uh, Tokyo in Japan, and so not all of these we could accommodate. So, and also Brisbane, and so as you've seen, so it's and and also Ghana in a homemade planetarium from the retirement funds of Dr. Jacob Ashong. Uh, it's the first sub-Saharan digital planetarium that we've done remotes with before. And so it's it's truly been a global reach, one world to another. That is really cool, Carter. I'm. I'm, I'm okay. so pleased. And also, to be I want to, I, David. I want to make. One, I want to have the person who's sitting next to you show his face. This is Michael Marcinkowski. Michael, I want you on camera. This is very important. This is Michael. Michael, Michael joined us on August 11th after I came back from Singapore last year, and he has been in here every weekend. He's been working late nights. This visualization is Michael's, and it's brought it to the world. It's a component of a larger project from Lin Shipping and Alex, our code master. But really, Michael is the one who has made this happen. And so it's very important. I just wanted to give a shout out to Michael and honor him. 
You're here. And uh, thanks, Carter, and, and thank you, Michael, and thanks to you guys at the uh, the AMNH and uh, Jeff Haynes Styles and everybody who's arranging this. When you were ticking off all those countries, I had this feeling that it's it's so cool that this is a global experience um, because as much as this morning there were a lot of people waving American flags and going USA, and yes, I mean I'm very proud of NASA, and I'm so happy that I uh, live in a country that is accomplishing things like this. But I also feel like this is something for the world, from the world, planet Earth, reaching out into the cosmos. And it's great that uh, you guys are facilitating us being able to really experience it in that way as a, a sort of uh, global, real-time experience. And uh, these, these graphics that you're doing, it, it's really bringing home to me what's, what's going on here. I'm really appreciative now that we are in the shadow of Pluto and coming out of the shadow of Pluto. It's, it's much less abstract and, and, and much more I can feel what's happening out there right now through this, the, the magic of imagination. It's almost like we're beating the speed of light by the fact that we can um, see what's going on here in real time. David, it's not magic, it's science. Right, but it's, uh, you know, a sufficiently advanced technology feels like magic. <laughs> Didn't somebody start saying that once? David, 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 give a word picture of, of the media crush outside side, the and the interest see in, in, in this mission. Oh, yeah, so, oh, yeah. so, so by the way, by the way here, here at the... At the uh, uh, APL, the Applied Physics Lab, uh, it's just a crazy zoo in a wonderful way. There are, uh, I don't know how many thousands of people converging and worldwide media and uh, it's, it's, um, it's like Woodstock of planetary exploration here right now. And then as you guys have been chatting and I was off camera, I was online kind of watching what's going on and it's, a, it's an explosion of Twitter, Twitter and Facebook and the online, uh, I, I feel like really the eyes of the world are, are we're sort of all joined together now, uh, experiencing our motion through the Pluto system, and it, it's really a, a, a kind of uh, virtual experience of exploration. I think that that we've never had before, and uh, it's just a, a real joy to participate in this with all of you. We're about to see that, that Donna, Donna has just, just joined us again. again. I'm not I'm seeing Sarah. 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 Do you have, you have any have comments? Any comments? Uh, hello, we live. Yes, yes, we are live. Live, live to the world. No, hello, quite friends of Pluto. Go ahead, Go ahead, Amati. Hello. Amati. hello. Yeah, we can hear you. I need to mute your microphone. Well, actually, well, actually you okay. Okay. Just, just go ahead with your question, your question or comment. Your comment. I'm sorry. I think we lost them again. I think we lost you. We heard you say hello. <laughs> and and we, were we were anxious to bring in some questions, questions from, from the Chopin in Sweden. In Sweden. Uh, I think we may have lost, lost that, that lead. lead. We're, we're out. out. We're out of the shadow. <laughs> All right. We have just emerged from Pluto's shadow. If, if you were on New Horizons right now, you would have just seen a sunrise. Uh, Right. around the limb of Pluto, and you could see the sun again. Of course, the sun would not look nearly as bright. It would be uh, a much dimmer. It would still be by far the brightest star in the sky, of course, but it would be noticeably a lot dimmer than we see it here on Earth. But you would have just seen it rise over the edge of Pluto from the perspective of New Horizons now looking back towards the inner solar system where, where we live, towards the Earth and towards the sun. It would be a thousand times dimmer. You want to quantify that statement. And having been to a solar eclipse, you see it get dimmer, but it seems to almost be in stages. And David, you and I were at the solar eclipse on July 11th of uh, uh, 1991. And, oh, yes, we were. Uh, I, I won't mention... Uh, <laughs> well, this, this is like Matt Carter, except we have clothes on now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> I, I, I also want to say that uh, as we exit, um, that uh, a dear friend of mine, composer um, Keith Patchell, has uh, created a four-part Pluto symphony, and that will be our exit mu uh, music, and it was our entry music um, today, so I just wanted to shout out to that, too. I want to thank Carter uh, for all he's done to uh, make this happen. Carter. Really, um, 
Carter, Carter Emart, our Director of Asper Visualization at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, uh, is, is his vision that, that actually, I think, was instrumental in making this happen for all of you and all of our, our colleagues around the world. And uh, thank you to the mission team for being so generous with your time, Fran and, and all the others. And Kathy. And, yes. and, uh, and of course, thank you, Jeff. And thank you for all our technical staff at all of the different uh, venues and locations, uh, particularly here at the museum. Uh, without uh, you, we would not be able to speak and talk to each other across such vast distances. Everyone rallied at the last minute. I really want to thank those people at the museum, too, that I might have flamed out on a little bit. But anyway, <laughs> you all brought it together, and I want to really a heartfelt thank you to this institution and all those institutions participating today. It's been truly an amazing journey, well, uh, even to just see it virtually. And these pictures are going to be coming in over the next 16 months, all but the full data set, as Alan Stern calls it, the gift that keeps on giving. And tonight at about 9 p.m., we will know that it worked. So stay tuned to to tonight right. when we find out the uh, I'm coming down detail to join there. You. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So thanks, so thanks everybody, everybody all around the world. Around the world. Thanks, for thanks for APL. APL. Stay, Stay tuned. tuned. You can find out all the latest images online. online. Uh, just, uh, just Google, Google, Google Horizons, Horizons and you and will find, find it. it. And thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Oh, nice turnout. Good point to it. So, uh, you might not remember me, but uh, we talked like 10 years ago when I was a student at the Boulder. Okay. Yeah, and I was. I was